Putin's Petroleum Warfare Ministry reveals the flame barrage defenses set up at vulnerable points around the British Isles to counter Nazi invasion attempts. Underwater pipeline installations encased in concrete and brickwork as a precaution against air attack release oil which spreads out to form many pools. Electrically released sodium ignites the gasoline. The objective is to form a solid wall of flame. Heat reaches an intensity in excess of 1,000 degrees. Additional pipelines on the beaches provide secondary defense by fire. The British planned this operation as a last ditch stand against Nazi attack while making practical use of vast oil stocks to prevent their seizure should an invasion succeed. RAF raids on Germany destroyed central control stations built by the Nazis for a similar flame defense of Germany. Another British weapon is the Flame ACAC unit. It was designed to be used against low-flying enemy planes, as well as to discourage glider and paratroop landings. Inland flame defense, which the British call Fugas. The Fugas was first used by the British during the retreat from Burma. It proved sufficiently effective to be adopted by both the British and American armies as a standard defensive tactic. leaflets were dropped behind German lines, threatening death by fire to invaders. A revolt in Prague, Czechoslovakia, shown in newly released Czech films of the four-day battle to free the city after the German surrender to the Allies. The revolt breaks out when the radio reports Allied troops are near. Czech patriots raise the American, British, and Russian flags and hoist the Czech banner on public buildings. Despite the announcement that the German army had capitulated and that the European war... ...protector of Bohemia refuses to recognize that his rule of Czechoslovakia has ended. Heavily armed German troops continue to patrol the city while SS men, under orders to suppress the revolt, attempt to maintain law and order. The Czech underground radio proclaims, the protectorate has fallen, the republic has been restored. The patriots tear up bricks from the streets to build barricades against German tanks, guns and infantry. In three hours, all Prague becomes a fortress. The patriots arm themselves with hand grenades, rifles and machine guns. With one weapon to every half dozen defenders, the Czechs pick up the weapons of their dead comrades to carry on the fight. Wounded and killed are dragged into the nearest refuge. Fire hoses are used to flush out Nazis. While the fierce struggle continues, the Czech radio broadcasts frantic appeals for aid from its American and Russian allies. Streetcar and automobile traffic are halted. After several days of fighting, German soldiers are disarmed as their general, hearing that Soviet troops are only 16 miles from Prague, offers to negotiate a truce with the Patriots. German soldiers and SS men are interned, while German civilians and Czech collaborators are rounded up and hauled off to jail. German forces are ordered to march toward the American headquarters at Pilsen. Nazi documents, flags and banners are torn up and destroyed in street bonfires. The first liberating Red Army units arrive in Prague. Fast-moving trucks carry Soviet troops into the city and huge Russian tanks lumber down the main streets of the capital. The hysterically happy Czech citizens welcome Red Army troops.
The Czech flag again fries over free Prague. A Czech Army Guard of Honor stands at attention at the Prague Railroad Station to welcome Dr. Eduard Benesch, President of the Republic of Czechoslovakia, who arrives in Prague a week after the revolt. Dr. Benesch is given a tremendous welcoming ovation by the citizens of Prague. Confiscated Nazi newsreel films show 12-ton V-2 rocket bombs just after leaving their launching platforms. Reaching a speed of 3,000 miles an hour, the rocket climbs vertically for 60 miles before beginning its descent. It's been known to reach England five minutes after launching from the Netherlands over 200 miles away. Signal Corps films of the main testing grounds for V-2 rocket motors. Ordnance intelligence officers discovered this huge installation in a former sleep quarry about 20 miles southeast of Saalfeld, Germany. On 24th June, the motors in their special crates are prepared for Army ordnance tests in the presence of two scientists flown from the States to obtain data on the reaction engines. Normally, the V-2 gets its fuel from two large tanks, one containing about a thousand gallons of alcohol, the other the same amount of liquid oxygen. A turbine, driven by chemically produced superheated steam, drives the pump that forces the fuel into the combustion chamber. The mixture is ignited electrically by remote control and, burning violently, rushes out as a jet of very hot gases, creating a thrust of about 26 tons, which launches the 12-ton projectile. About one minute after launching, the fuel is cut off by radio control or automatic instruments. The point at which the fuel is cut off determines the range. For the longer it burns, the faster and farther the rocket travels. Ordnance Technical Intelligence reports and data compiled by the British Air Ministry have made available a complete breakdown on V-2 construction and performance characteristics. While the Nazis made substantial claims as to the effectiveness of the stratospheric rocket bomb, Britain classified it as an ingenious weapon, but inaccurate and in its present state of doubtful military value. Delta Base, 18 miles north of Marseille, France, comprising three staging zones covering an area of over 10 square miles. Service units being redeployed directly to the Pacific are quartered here while awaiting the arrival of ships. The installations at saint victor and Cala can accommodate more than 200,000 troops. Night and day, men and vehicles pour into the vast cantonment. Deriving its name from the delta of the Rhone River, the base is commanded by Brigadier General J.P. Ratte. He returns the salute of Colonel Masegis in charge of the Kala staging area number one. During the temporary stopover, worldwide news and other information are disseminated to the troops. Equipment is checked. 
Departure for Marseille on 24th June. Troops from the many redeployment centers of the ETO Assembly Area Command now leave Delta Base for their last overland journey before boarding the troop ships. At Marseille, which is the nearest French port to the Far East, the service units embark on boats headed through the Mediterranean and Suez Canal, then through the Indian Ocean to the Pacific. Pacific-bound troops march from Camp Stoneman staging area for the San Francisco port of embarkation. Already processed for overseas, the men will be transported by harbor boats to the Bay Area for transfer to troop ships. A Red Cross contingent embarks with the troops. boarding a transport at San Francisco after the trip from Stoneman. The Army's announced goal for the Pacific War is an army of seven million. Japan has about four million men under arms. Cooking, baking, and lighting equipment converted for use with leaded fuel. A tube packed with steel wool, which acts as a combination filter generator, replaces the old style generator in the M1937 field range. This fire unit is currently being issued with the new filter generator, but on old ranges it can be installed easily. There are numerous advantages to the employment of a component which permits the burning of leaded gas. Procuring unleaded fuel is often a problem in the field. Standardization of equipment so that only one type of fuel is required naturally simplifies supply. When a filter burns out and another isn't available, it can be renewed by sawing the tube in two and packing it with fresh steel wool or crumbled asbestos. Then the parts are welded together again. Another time-saving innovation is a starting shield for concentrating the heat during preheating of the filter generator. The new fire unit is leak-proof, easier to maintain, and gives longer service than its predecessor, approximately 200 to 300 hours. In the M1942 bake oven, the pot-type burner replaces all other heating units. Designed for simplified operation and ease in cleaning, it also heats the oven faster. Again, there's no difficulty in making the switch over from old to new burner. Once inserted, the heating unit remains intact without necessity for removal when shipping the oven. Swinging this meter back into position is all that's necessary. The directive states that kerosene or light diesel oil can be used if gasoline is not available, but the latter is preferable. As the fuel flows by gravity rather than under air pressure, the danger of explosion is greatly reduced. Finally, the gasoline lantern is adopted by the QM for use with leaded fuel. A single mantle and a curved generator keep the lantern from overheating. By comparison, the old lantern became overheated and formed carbon because the generator was so close to the double mantle. When the new generator tip gets clogged with carbon, it is removed. Cleaning is easily accomplished by using an implement furnished with a unit. Outfits in the field are advised that lanterns are now issued with a new generator assembly. For lanterns already in use, this conversion set is available with complete instructions for installation, maintenance, and operation. These sets can be requisitioned through regular supply channels. Navy films of kamikaze attacks on units of the fleet. A suicide plane breaks through heavy anti-aircraft fire to strike an American destroyer. Hitting direct.
directly at the base of the after stack, the crash completely shears off the stack and damages the bridge and superstructure. Many of the crew are cut off by the burning midsection of the ship. Another destroyer comes to the aid of the vessel. Live torpedoes are hit and damaged by the suicide plane, but they do not explode. This ship, a 2100-ton Fletcher-class destroyer, was commissioned in 1943. Water is poured into the burning ship to help bring the fire under control. The shattered destroyer, moving under its own power, heads for a repair yard. <laughs> At dawn on 23rd June, C-47s loaded with paratroopers of the 11th Airborne Division take off for a landing near the North Luzon port of Apari. The first landing is at 0910 in bright sunshine and without enemy opposition. Supplies and men are dropped at the same time. Objective is to have the paratroopers join in the final battle of the Cagayan Valley, where an estimated 20,000 enemy soldiers are trapped. The jump troops are veterans of the Manila campaign and are to make contact with the guerrillas already in the area. Reinforcement of the guerrillas will tighten the hold on the northern end of the valley, while elements of the 37th Division drive up from the south. For the first time in the Southwest Pacific, gliders are used in the operation. CG-4s towed by C-46s bring in jeeps and mobile radio equipment within 10 minutes after the first troops land. Equipped with pack howitzers, the paratroopers assemble for a rapid push up the Cagayan River in a combined force with the guerrillas. Major General Joseph M. Swing, commander of the task force, confers with one of his officers, then starts for a forward observation post. The troops move up to tighten the pincer movement on the enemy forces trapped within a few miles of where the Japs first invaded the Philippines in 1941. A PT boat task unit of the 7th Fleet on a night patrol and strafing mission along the northwest coast of Borneo. During the patrol, the PT boats open up an attack on enemy-held oil installations at Seria in the Miri area, Sarawak. and smoke cover the shore as installations, storage tanks, and derricks are hit. The PT boats move out to sea. PTs continue to harass the enemy on Borneo, shelling coastal positions and troop concentrations and hitting small shipping around the island. <laughs> 